Our next uh, case study is, is more local here, and actually the developer's been many places around the country, but has done some work right here in Pinellas County. Uh, Mr. Uh, Joseph Kokolakis is uh, both a local developer and the current owner of J. Kokolakis Con Contracting Incorporated. His projects range from office and warehouse facilities in New York to retail and residential development in Florida. With nearly 25 years of construction industry experience, Mr. Kokolakis also manages the day-to-day -day operations of the contracting company, a $175 million per year public works contractor currently working in Colorado, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Louisiana, and Florida. Mr. Kokolakis received his Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics from the State University of New York at Stony Brook and a Doctor of Law from Emory University of Law. Joseph? There you Good afternoon. I guess I'll put this back in here. Because as you will all s soon learn, I'm not very proficient in public speaking. Um, uh, when I actually was asked by Commissioner Seal to, to speak today, I, you know, since I realize that I, I typically don't do this, I'm a general contractor and I have the privilege of working, you know, at least mostly uh, east of the Rockies. Uh, uh, from our perspective, it's a competitive bid process. Typically, you present your qualifications, and either you get the job if you're low or you don't. Um, frankly, I was surprised when I was asked to speak as a developer because I don't consider myself a developer. I consider myself as a, a resident, a member of the community, and someone who has a, a passion for, for taking old and, and neglected buildings and, and revitalizing them. And, and the feeling you get when you take that building and, and you convert it to something that has an impact on not only yourself financially, because typically if, if you address the risks, and my, my presentation will kind of go through that, but if you address the risks and quantify the risks um, accurately, uh, what you can do is change a community. And what you can do is, if, you know, it's the most sustainable process of development that is imaginable because you're taking something old that could easily be converted into a pile of rubble and probably more efficiently and effectively be converted to a pile of rubble and turned into a Walgreens, and you're not doing that. And, and the reason that you are all here is to figure out how to incentivize a guy like me to not do that. Um, and that is, you know, again, I guess one of, when I found out I was speaking, I asked a few people that are uh, more used to this sort of thing, and they said, the first thing you need to do is make sure you don't speak in the afternoon, because everybody's half asleep <laughs> after lunch, and that didn't quite work out. And they said, if you do, make sure there's coffee, which there isn't any coffee. Uh, um, and then they said, most importantly, a good speaker scares the crap out of everybody that's listening to generate work. Um, and Mr. Fruth is an excellent speaker because he scared the crap out of me after hearing his presentation and seeing you know, the future of Pinellas County had the leaders of this county not been here, had the commissioners not initiated the symposium and, and uh, understood the risk of not working together. There were surrounding counties immediately to the east of us that, that while they're doing their best, it's a fragmented approach. And by coordinating your efforts and by working together, I think you can figure out how to properly incentivize, not eliminate the risk, because I don't think you're in the business of that, but to try and mitigate the risk of a developer. Uh, because again, and, and again, my topic is adaptive reuse, and there are inherent risks in adaptive, adaptive reuse of a building. that Most of them are instinctive, um, but we'll kind of go through them. There we go. So, you know, again, um, the key, in my opinion, to an adaptive reuse is having the ability to develop a sense of space. It's, it's a lot more than concrete floors and exposed trusses and some spiral ductwork. It's the community around it that needs to evolve for it to be worthwhile. Uh, the combination of, of residential and, you know, the whole mixed use thing, that's typically the buzzword, but the combination of residential and office uh, professional, it's important. And it's important to create that dynamic in a neighborhood where people can feel, that whole live, work, play thing, people can feel that they're living in a community that cares about them, that they're comfortable in, that they know their neighbors. And an adaptive reuse project in Pinellas County and in the very many cities that have a tremendous amount of heritage and quaint um, downtown cores, it makes sense and it makes a tremendous amount of sense. 
a large part of that is going to revolve around how you as the leaders of this community uh, guide and develop the plan because it's a lot more than just a downtown core. Um, it's much easier for me as a developer to do a Walgreens uh, on Clearwater Beach. And even though it's architecturally somewhat, you know, kind of cool, um, it's still a Walgreens. And it's much easier for me as a developer to convince the banks and the underwriters that my pro forma is a lot more sensible by scraping a building and, and building new rather than in barking on a renovation project that typically has a tremendous amount of unknowns. You've got the environmental issues, you've got mold abatement, asbestos, lead, uh, you've got just building envelope issues that are a tremendous expense. Uh, and there are ones that if your building is not functional, it doesn't matter where it is, if there's no parking, if there are an issue, everyone talks about mixed use, but you need areas for dumpsters, for restaurant dumpsters, say if you have a cafe, you have hoods, you have grease traps. There's a tremendous amount of, of complications there that make it much more of a challenge to develop than a clean scrape. Um, but again, you know, uh, and when you look at the slide, you know, as far as the old brewery in Ybor City, you know, that, and that's one of my case studies, but that would not have happened had it not been for Mayor Dick Greco at the time and his, his working with us, which we'll review, um, and Sterling Commons in downtown Dunedin. You know, that was an old rec center that sat abandoned for years. Uh, but if it wasn't for the, the incentives and more or less the culture that the city of Dunedin has developed over the course of the years, um, it would have been much easier to move on somewhere else and develop somewhere else. Um, but again, you know, I guess, you know, kind of James, James said earlier that most of these decisions are analytically driven and, and they're not. Uh, at least in my case, they're, they're, it's a passion, it's something that you, you, you love doing, and it's, it's rewarding. It's, it's rewarding for many ways. Well, the advantages, again, they're pretty instinctive. Uh, I think all of them you pretty much understand, but the key one is in the environment. Um, I'm not you know, a, a typical tree hugger kind of guy, but I do understand being in construction of what, what goes into a landfill and what doesn't. And when you have a building that you can salvage, um, you know, uh, on, on the one project we did, we ground up whatever we demolished and used it for the base on Sterling Commons. So we used it for the base for the parking lot. There's pervious asphalt. Uh, the buildings that we saved are, have enough points to be lead gold, gold certifiable, uh, but I didn't do it because I was cheap and I didn't feel I needed the marketing aspect of it. But it's important and it's important to the tenants and those facilities command higher rents because everyone wants to be part of it. Everyone wants to be part of uh, something that's new, something that's dynamic and creative. And ultimately, it comes down to money. Um, you know, it comes down to greed in some ways, uh, where you want to ensure that the investment you make and your cost per square foot to develop a piece of property is realized in rents per square foot. And the market is critical and it will affect the decisions. I mean, as Craig said, you know, that if you can't get the 38 bucks a foot in downtown Orlando, you're not building an office space that's going to attract the kind of national tenant that we've been discussing all morning. The disadvantages, it's probably the wrong word because it's really disincentives. Uh, and probably where you all come in the most because the disincentives to an adaptive reuse project are the risk. It's the exposure um, and of the unknowns. And in some cases on our project in New York, uh, the town of Islip abated all the asbestos. It was an old cannon building facility. It was full of asbestos. It had other environmental issues. And as part of their program, they paid for the abatement. And it's much easier to walk into a bank with a pro forma that's a clean piece of property with a clean bill of health and, and a community around it willing to take that risk and that partnership. You know, I'm going to throw around the term public partnership too later, public-private partnership, but not in the way that is sort of been somewhat overused. And successful adaptive reuse project is a public-private partnership because through the incentives that are, you know, initiated by the municipality and communicated effectively by the municipality, that drives interest and that interest, you know, leads to development. So now, typically, the path to adaptive reuse, and this is, again, this is just my thought process, which good or bad, it is what it is. Um, you, it, you have to ensure that your concept aligns with the location. You know, when I'm driving through uh, Tarpon Springs, I think of what could probably work downtown on the docks. When I'm driving through St. Pete, I think of what could work, whether it's with the university's factor or as dormitories. 
Um, you really got to think of where it is that you're going to build. Uh, in New York, we took that kind of facility and converted it to offices um, because it made sense. I think that's a critical aspect of any analysis that in a lot of ways is very subjective and there's no data that would lead me to a particular decision. Um, typically, especially from my perspective, you make your decision and then you find the consultant that will develop the data to support your decision and give that to the bank, um, which there's a lot of bankers here, so I probably shouldn't be saying that. Um, but essentially, once you figure out if your location is, is, is where you want to be for what you want to build, then you look towards site suitability. Because again, you know, that site-specific analysis it's all about you know, parking and functionality. And again, you can have all the amenities. You can have the library across the street, and you can have the water, and you can have the cultural center. But if people don't have a place to park, the project will fail. If, if functionally, uh, your employees are paying to park across the street in $10 an hour, like you know, we have issues on Clearwater Beach, for example, uh, uh, I think it's, it's critical that you analyze the suitability of the particular site and don't get enamored by the romance of the building itself and of the project itself. Again, I'll bring up the city of Dunedin again and I apologize, but, but, but from my perspective, you know, there were two major factors that were impeding development of downtown in Dunedin. One was a, a land uh, dedication ordinance, an LDO, uh, which was enacted in the 70s and had a tremendous purpose to ensure that the the kind of the roll-up neighborhoods that we're all here to talk about changing were protected and, and, and ensure that there was park space based on each residence uh, in a community. And that fee, because of the success of downtown and the, 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 the pricing of downtown land hitting $2 million an acre or so, basically ensured that no one would ever build a residence in downtown Dunedin because it essentially was an impact fee that amounted to close to $30,000 per unit. Um, a, ad hoc committee of volunteers, merchants associations, uh, all got together, developed essentially a, a brief that they presented working with staff and then to the commission and the commission acted on it. And since then, projects are ramping up again, one of them being mine. Um, parking, same thing. Downtown Dunedin is, is in some ways you know, a victim of its own success. Limited parking, the community has gotten involved and I think that's critical. Everyone needs to listen to the community. An adaptive reuse project is a great opportunity for both developers and, and the public sector, staff, commissioners, to hear and listen to the community. It gives them the excuse to actually talk to them and, and get their feedback and, and, and help develop their trust that you're all gonna act on it, on what their comments are. And I think we've been successful there. Um, which, yeah, it goes right to the municipal partner uh, because it is critical. Uh, and maybe it's just laziness or selfishness or whatever, but I won't do anything if I don't feel that the community and the leaders of that community uh, share the vision. Uh, and the vision is it's twofold. Like I said, it's about making money, but it's about making money in a controlled environment that we ensure that the economic viability of a project doesn't outweigh the overall common good. And, and that is your biggest challenge, to somehow balance through incentives, through programs, the need to initiate change without selling your souls to developers, you know, because I'm a member of the community and I want to ensure that what I build there is something that I'll be proud of forever. Um, so I think, you know, f from my perspective, it's worked well. Uh, you have a tremendous amount of tools to address the concerns, again, that were raised this morning, adaptive reuse and the incentives you need to initiate those projects. It's just one, one of the many tools that you have. Um, yeah, I, I think, well, I guess we did talk about some of them, you know, the impact fees and the lowering of impact fees. Um, fast track or streamlined permitting, I think that's tremendous. And, and when you have, you know, certain, whether it's a district or a more general approach where there's certain criteria that are met by the municipality, fast track those because you know, speed to market is critical. Uh, whether it's condos or a national tenant or an office, they can't afford to wait two, three years for things to settle up. I won't work on Long Island because each little municipality on Long Island just takes forever uh, and their vision is, is, is fragmented and, and their political support really doesn't help. And, and, and I think it's a shared vision or share, a shared opinion of Long Island, and it's withering on the vine right now. There, there are things, you know, as a part of New York. 
Um, mixed use development zoning, things like that. You know, again, as I said earlier, it's a great thing to have, but for it to happen, you all need to incentivize it. Uh, the LDO fee that I mentioned, um, it was essentially an impact fee based on, on uh, the value of the property with a multiplier for a park space. Uh, the reduction wasn't just a straight reduction where they essentially said, here, developer, you know, we're not going to charge you that anymore. They bought control of my project through the LDO fee because it, there was a 15% or so reduction based on an architecturally significant uh, building. Another 15 or so percent, and I'm, I don't know what the percentage are exactly, but um, based on the utilization of public space, or actually the, the introduction of public space. Uh, they were involved in the design process, and the community was involved in the design process through that LDO fee reduction. That's exactly what you need to do. Um, I think, I, you know, me personally, I would be against just a, a, a across the board reduction in the fees. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, as I said, municipal partners, which I was the earlier slide, but, you know, Mike, Mike Crawford said it best that in some ways you need to be concerned about a developer, about guys like me taking the easy way. And the only thing that I see that can change that is through the incentive process and working well with the, with, with the community. Um, now, time for the professionals. This is more the practical aspect of it, but any project that is the renovation of an existing space, you need to have a, a team of qualified professionals that, are, that share your vision, that share your appetite for risk, that are willing to take chances. You know, if you hire a structural engineer and you bring them into an old building in Ybor City with walls that, you know, or suspect, um, he needs to find the safest and most economical way to shore those walls up. You can't afford to have someone come in there and, and think of his errors in emissions policy and, and, and over-design it because those costs will push the project out of contention. Uh, same thing whether it's uh, windows and building envelopes, uh, civil engineers, stormwater. Stormwater is a critical issue, especially with adaptive reuse where you have limited uh, sites. Um, I think there needs to be a concerted effort to have a global approach, countywide, citywide, um, uh, towards stormwater control and treatment because it, it, it's impossible if everyone's mindset is, you know, put a swale, a retention pond, and, and a driveway, and call us when you get the, all that on your little postage size stamp, it isn't going to happen. But you need to figure out how to, how to have stormwater storage somewhere and how to get the water there, which is going to be the hard part. Oh, well, finance. You know, I think the debt markets have, you know, softened tremendously. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity now. The things that the banks seem to be asking, uh, are a lot more understandable and reasonable than the, what they were asking before. Their appetite for risk has grown. I think they're very interested in generating business and they realize that to generate more business, they need to be part of the community. And they realize that to be part of, of the community, adaptive reuse jobs are perfect because there are signs on the front and they're part of that revitalization, of that improvement of a neighborhood. Now, here's my case studies now. Well, most of them I kind of discussed already, but again, Sterling Commons was two buildings. It was a rec center. It was an old office building. Both were scheduled to be demolished by a condo developer uh, that unfortunately was caught at the wrong time. Uh, and both, through working with the city, um, and you know, again, it's mine, but uh, are, are a tremendous asset to the community. We have the Dunedin Fine Arts Center taking the second floor. They've got studios on the second floor, 12 artists there, a uh, tremendous amount of business opportunity. And just, it, 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 it changed that whole downtown core area south of Main Street. In, on Broadway. And it's sustainable. I guess if you want to talk about one that's sustainable, that's, that's the one because whether it's the roof, whether it's, you know, low flow fixtures, um, every aspect of that project, it, there was an environmental thought in mind of how to keep it more sustainable. Uh, Florida Brewery is probably the coolest thing I've done. It's in Ybor City. Uh, but again, that building was empty from 1963. It was built in 1996. And in 63, uh, it was part of the uh, well, when, when Batista fell and Castro took over in the embargo, uh, they were no longer able to export tro La Tropical beer, so it sat empty. Um, that is a perfect example of taking, you know, and creating jobs, but taking a facility that, that was decrepit and, and, and turning it into something productive. That could not have happened without the city of Tampa's out of a Lorem tax exemption. It could not have happened without the federal government's historic tax credits of 20% of all costs, hard costs, soft costs. Even my, my closing costs, my architectural fees, were all included in that credit that we received, which a tax credit, which I learned, is a lot better than a tax deduction or anything else, because it's, it's an across-the-board, you know, get-out-of-jail-free card. 
so that project has been tremendous from my perspective and was, and I'd like to think, a catalyst for the, the resurgence of Ybor City. Um, you know, conclusions quantify your known risks. You know, contingencies are important, and the banks need to understand that, and you need to understand that, and, and you double them, because you're gonna find things. Uh, you know, I'm a contractor, that's what I do. Um, but it's important, you know, partner with professionals, again, that share your vision, uh, because that's critical. Uh, a bad engineer can kill the job. Um, listen to the community. I think there's nothing more important than ensuring that you have the community buy-in for the project. Think about the uses they want, think about what they're lacking, and try to address that. But you, you all, we all, have to listen. And then celebrate the success, because I really do believe that it's one of the few cases where you can be a developer, you can change a community, and you can make money at it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.